Right. Failure right. is never good. Right. Failure just means, for 99% of cases, failure means disaster. Right. It means going hungry, it means never getting back up again. Welcome back everybody, Richard Baker here, Collector Responsibility here with Dave McCoggan. Um, we are here to talk today about engagement. He has 30 years in marketing, advertising industry, shock and awe, and then how sustainability social entrepreneurs can deploy these tools to advance their issues. Uh, do me a favor, tell me a little about yourself and how you, like your background and what you've been working on over the last 30 Ever. years in Asia. Forever. Yeah, forever. I'm an Aussie from Sydney, actually from a place called Parramatta on the outskirts of Sydney. Um, library science degree, political science degree, worked as a children's librarian and storyteller for 10 years in public libraries in Australia. Accidentally got a job in advertising, like literally mm. uh, applied for a job not knowing it was an ad agency. Okay. They didn't tell me until the second phone call that it was actually a job at an ad agency. <laughs> The day I started work there, they asked me, what do you want to do? And I said, I'm, I don't know, what do you want me to do? And they said, we don't know. Yeah. Um, I stayed with that company nearly 30 years and never had a job description in once. Um, and then about three years ago, I decided, uh, well, mutual decision to part ways with the big company, um, which is fine by me. Moved back here to Bangkok uh, and set up a couple of little companies or co-set up a couple of little companies to do different aspects of marketing, storytelling, but one is sort of partly in the more traditional things of how you develop stories and uh, why people are attracted to stories and how to use stories. Um, and then the other side primarily using the sort of more advanced of how to use artificial intelligence to, to explore narratives across the internet. So I guess my first question then is, um, you know, entrepreneurship right now is a very romantic idea of a lot of people and a lot of people talk about wanting to jump out and yeah. start their own thing. Yeah. You've done that. Um, well, let, let, <laughs> let, let, let me stop you right there. Yeah. One of the big bugbears I've had for years and years and years mm. is this concept that you can't be entrepreneurial if you work for a company. Mm. Um, now, and I always use the example that, you know, as I said, uh, for most of the 28 years I worked for this big American corporation. I didn't have a job description. Mm. I was allowed to do what I wanted a lot of the time. I created, um, for example, I created a, a research platform out of Southeast Asia that became the global research platform for this multinational company. Um, I created a whole bunch of other tools. Um, uh, ways to access different bits of business, uh, looking at different types of businesses they should go into. Okay. So to me, that's entrepreneurial, yeah. right? Um, it, it's got nothing to do with, I've gone off and started my uh, business. So by the other token, the last few years as this, as this word entrepreneurial has been overused, overused, overused. Mm. If you are, if you're the nice lady behind the camera here, and she decides to go off and she wants to start a bakery tomorrow mm. and make cakes and sell cakes on a corner store. I don't call that entrepreneurial. Why? Because it's great, there's nothing wrong with it, but it's not entrepreneurial because millions of other young women across Asia have gone off in the last 10 years and created cakes selling them out of a shop. Mm. That's not entrepreneurial, that's not being risk taker. That's, mm. that's actually the opposite of being a risk taker. Okay, okay. Because you know it's safe enough that... Um, because the model's out there. Everybody's yeah. done it. You know, like thousands of people have done it. You'd be, the only risk is, are you an idiot? <laughs> um, you know, have you, are you going to pick somewhere that's obviously the wrong location? Um, do you make really shitty cakes? Yeah. Uh, you know, um, obviously, are you really bad at personal service? Okay. Um, you know? Right. Um, but entrepreneurism is a, is a thing that I have no problem with the fact that it's it's so-called booming. Mm. But I have a I have a problem when we think it's limited to individuals going off starting a brand new business in some way. Okay. Um, I also think that the one of the issues with entrepreneurism and this the, and with it the parallel thought about being a risk taker and that risk taking is good. Mm. Um, you know, since uh, LinkedIn and Facebook, et cetera, have been pop massively popularized, you can't click on one of those any day without seeing some 
usually misplaced or misused quote mm -hmm. about the fact that you know you learn by your mistakes if you don't right. fail you won't learn right. well the truth is that most people that fail just fail right. failure right. is never good Right. Failure just means, for 99% of cases, failure means disaster. Right. It means going hungry, it means never getting back up again. Right. So it's not about you learn by your failure, because most people can't learn by failure. Mm. It's you learn by success. Okay. Now actually, this is actually really probably as well into our earlier conversation with the nonprofit. And I know you work with the WTO, yeah. the World Toilet Organization. The other WTO. Yeah, the, other the other WTO. So Jack, he's passionate about what he believes is his vision. Yeah. How do these entrepreneurs create that message or better align to, like, how, how, what's the process they should go through? I mean, we, living in the, in the world, we talked about, before we went on camera, we talked about the way societies have changed, the, mm. the urbanization, the desire to move into the middle class. The defining technology of middle classness is a flushing indoor toilet, mm. not a mobile phone. Very true. As, as somebody pointed out to me in some research I did with newly urbanized families a number of years ago, she said, look, my cousins up in the village live in basically wooden grass shacks. Right. They have colour television. Some of them have refrigerators. Mm. Some have mobile phones. Some of them have microwaves. Right. If you can steal electricity from the highway, you can run those things. Right. But none of them, none of them have put me into the net, which is the term she used, mm. have put me into the net. And the net was the sewerage system, right. because that's the defining technology of urbanization. It's the mm -hmm. defining technology of modern life. Yeah. One of the things I struggle with is helping people from outside help what's going on with understanding what's going on locally. So what you just mentioned, most Westerners, let's just call it most US, most, they have no idea what it means to be without public toilets. Like if you got to use the loo, you've got a mall or something, like you're in your car, like you sure. know, you've got... What's the, how do you talk to that group differently than you do to say the local population who's a real, I mean, they really understand the problem. Some of them are looking for solutions. Some of them are willing to act on them. That's a whole different story. But if you need the Western side to right. empathize, have compassion. Well, you know, one of the things is you, you do things like the, the toilet run, which mm -hmm. we've started doing, or the WTO started running in more developed cities in different parts of the world uh, as well. That's a one-off little goofy thing that if you're lucky, you're going to get a photo in, you know, a couple of things and stuff like that, right? You're not going to get, this is not going to be the ice bucket challenge and take over the world. But I think what you do is, one of the things you have to do is, you have, it, it's, it's like shock and awe. So, and I'll give you the example. Um, if you're in America, Western Europe, Australia, develop, you know, the, the developed sure. Western world, most of those countries have got an aging population crisis. Uh, maybe not quite at the level of Japan, mm. but if you're Italy, Coming. my wife's Italian. She has three living aunts who are all in their late 80s, early 90s mm. right, uh, in Italy. Mm. Um, you know, one of the things you do is you raise awareness. Like, guys our age will have ourselves or our wives will have parents who are in their 80s and 90s. Sure. And almost invariably, everybody in their 50s today, or 60s, has at least one parent still alive, or one in-law parent still alive, right? And you know, when you get to your, your 70s and your 80s, right? I mean, you can watch it. People basically judge where they're gonna go by the availability of toilets. Yeah. They do, right? Talk to anybody in these big cities, in mm. any big developed Western city, and you talk to anybody in their 80s, about where do they normally go, what's their normal routine during the week, and right. I can guarantee you they know where every toilet is. Around that. That they normally, you know, I go to this mall once on a Thursday to do shopping, and I can tell you where the toilets are. Right, I like right. to go for a beer with my old buddies three mm. nights a week, but you know, that, that pub's got a toilet and it's easy to get into, whatever. Right, right, right. So what you do is take it away, and take it away and say to the people that are more in their, their sons and daughters' ages in the 40s, 50s and 60s, mm. okay, so now you've got a, you've got a mother, mm. she's 80, she's a nice lady, but she's never going to have access to a public toilet again. Holy shit, what are you going to do with that? Where are they going to go? So connecting on a day-to-day -day personal level is... Everyone's personal, right? Shock and awe always comes down to the things that really, really worry us. What I find with a lot of social issues and environmental, like the people you're helping, yeah. 
you can bring this message to, you can talk about the benefits, the yep. impact. Sure. Then you have to switch tack, you have to go find donors or government yeah. or average Twitter users yeah. to click into your message. As someone who's spent 30 years in that messaging, like, how difficult is that? And yeah. then what are some things that social entrepreneurs who have a small team, like how, how should they tackle that? Or how? Shock and awe. Okay. If you think about the, the big brands in the world, yeah. okay, Yes, of course, now they, we take them for granted, and that's because they spend massive amounts of money to keep themselves in your face, mm -hmm. right? But you go, go back in history to most of the big brands that we associate with, what made them successful in the first place? Mm. They didn't have massive TV spends or massive, you know, putting every time you clicked on your Facebook page, there was an ad running beside it right. for your favorite beer, right? Mm. Most of these things were because, you know, at some point, they did something or they had a line or they had an angle that within a relative the relative space of the world they were playing in mm. created attention and yeah. and the truth is those sorts of those sorts of ads and campaigns they can't help but get it people right now right. they don't get it everybody right because you know the truth is there's hard-hearted people there's people that don't care that da -da. Mm. but there's going to be a, a large enough lump of people quite often that sort of say that one photo alone will will mm. shock and all people into it how do you keep attention do you use crying babies? Or do you use happy teenagers who've benefited from the process and, of And that's what I mean, right? yeah, so you're right, that's quite often the shock and awe mm. has to be down done in different ways. The truth is we've had the crying babies thing for since Biafra in the 70s, yeah. right? Literally since Biafra in the 70s. And yes, you can still do it in slightly different photographic ways or whatever, and you can have whatever. But the truth is that for most of us, it's sort of like a background noise that we've been yeah. seeing our whole life. Mm. But you're right, then the shock and awe becomes personalization. Mm. So, you know, we start to see some things where it's in today's world, uh, a bit like you're doing, you know, you create YouTube type messages, films, whatever, mm. that are about people's experiences. Social media is very tough, yeah. right? Because it's moving so fast. You ha it's not just shock and awe, it's like a consistent so, shock and awe. So how, how do you like... So here's the thing. ALS, uh, the Ice Bucket Challenge, right? Yeah. Uh, really great, uh, obviously had a huge impact. Um, raised $60 million. Raised 60 million bucks. Uh, you know, obviously being in the business I'm in for, for the next year, the number of companies, not, nothing to do with ALS, nothing to do with disease or mm -hmm. charities, the number of FMCG companies, the companies say, no, we need an ALS Ice Bucket type campaign. Mm. Yeah, don't be ridiculous. A, that, it's a bit of a fluke, right? I mean, it is a bit of a fluke to be that successful with these things. No, what do you think made it work? Um, if you break it Look, down. I think sometimes it helps that there's not much else going on. Okay. Okay, so, you know, quite obviously, uh, if it was in the middle of the Trump madness, mm, you know, YouTube and everything else is full of that, right? right. You know, um, if it's in the middle of... Uh, what's his name up in North Korea mm. going off again the world gets distracted it, you know if, you, if you're in the middle of summer and especially in the US and there's not anything really big going on mm. that helps okay so timing helps yeah. uh, what else is happening around you it, it helps like and you probably had 10 15 100 ideas how do you narrow down what's the best idea how do you know what's the lay down in Ginza versus well, something just so... Well, you know, the second, you know, first you've got to understand what people want, right? And then mm -hmm. the second thing you've got to understand is the cultural things that go on. So there are things in some countries that you can't, that you, or cultures you can do and others you can't, right? Okay. Uh, the simple act of saying, look, we're going to, with police permission, because sure. it's Japan, right? Sure. But with police permission, we're going to block off a section of the Ginza or the route around the Imperial Palace or whatever and have a bunch of people lay down there. Wow, that's pretty shocking. Mm. That's pretty, wow. And so what you're looking is for something that is going to draw a bit of a crowd, but the journalists are going to look at, that camp, film cameras are going to come up, turn up for. Sure, sure. Because sure. you have to have the stuff that is going to appear on, depending on the country, on mm. the, the mainstream media. You, you, yeah. You'd love to get your 60 seconds on a CBS or BBC mm -hmm. or whatever. That's, that's okay. And in Japan, that's a little bit easier to manipulate. But, what's but you really want to get mm. is... 50 people filming it and, and shoving it up on YouTube or Facebook or, or whatever. Yeah, it's also about, like, what's more important now? Getting NHK TV to give you a 60 second air? Depends on the country. Depends on the country. Depends okay. on the culture. Yeah. You know, again, um, we think of 
uh, social media in certain ways, uh, those of us that are in the communications business, right? Mm. Because we're trained, to, trained for that by basically the American models and the American uh, marketing media. Okay. But if you look at simple things like, if you if, if compare Japan to the United States, right? And I always often say that, look, there are two no more diametrically opposed countries than Japan and the United States, mm. right? and in so many ways. And, uh, but if you look at it this way, um, in a survey that was done a couple of years ago of mothers in about, I think we did it in about 30 countries around the world. We asked a thousand mothers a bunch of questions mm. right, in each country. One of the questions was, okay, when you think about your toddler, your infant, what's the best source of information if you're gonna be buying goods, food, clothes, whatever, for your infant? Mm. Now, not surprisingly, number one just about everywhere was your mother. Mm -hmm. So if you're a new mother, you ask your mother, right? right. Older sisters, best friends. Mm -hmm. So people you physically really know and you've known for years and years and years, yeah. okay? Now, of course, things like blogs come up very high everywhere. Yeah. But the difference between Japan and America was one of the highest scoring things in Japan was broadcast television. Interesting. Why? Because it's the number one social media in Japan. Mm. Why is it the number one social media? Because Japan is a collectivist country. Everything is based on everybody else doing it. Mm. So if you see it as on broadcast television, it's a safe bet. If I see it's on a blog, well, I'm not too sure how many people have seen that blog. Interesting. Right? So, so you got to know your market. You've got you to gotta know, know what matters to people, yeah. the culture that's going on, mm -hmm. and, and what will work.